Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to stage founder of Atari and godfather of gaming, Nolan Bushnell. I won't run, I won't fly, I will never make it by without you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Boy, what a great gaming experience this is. You know, I just, have you ever had so much fun? Really, come on. Yell about it. I want to talk about video games today, at the very beginning, and a little bit about what I think the future is going to hold. And uh, the whole idea is, for me, I would love to turn all the game players into game designers and game builders. Because it turns out that the best game has not been designed. The best app is still out there somewhere. And it's probably going to be done by one of you. You just have to decide who it's going to be. These are really, really, really exciting times because we have so many opportunities. Because video games are not just fun, but it turns out that they operate on some really good brain science. I'm going to tell you a secret. Video games are addictive. The first one is free. But it turns out that the same things that make video games so powerful and so addictive and so fun is that it hits all the right centers in your brain. And in fact, those same centers make it easy to learn. And I'm working on some stuff right now that really uses game dynamics. And we're teaching using video games 10 times faster. And I'd love to have you support this project a little bit. Anyway, let's talk about history a little bit. Nobody knows who this guy is, but this is a guy named Dr. Evans, who was my professor at the University of Utah. And he basically was one of the first guys that really did the, the seminal work in graphic displays. In the early days of computers, we used big line printers. Video tubes were not normal. It was very, very, you know, crazy. I was going to, the, to college for, in electrical engineering at the University of Utah while working at an amusement park, this one. And I became game manager. And you say, hmm. And so winters working at the university or, and uh, studying at the university with a guy who was hooking computers up to video screens. I understood the economics of the arcade business. Yeah, stuff like this. Not too cool, but it was a start. This is a PDP-1. This is a computer that was the first digital use of video games. And it was a game called Space War. And it was on a graphic display, green. The computer was a monster. It had a blistering. 100 kilohertz clock speed. Do you realize how slow that is? Kilohertz. That is 0.1 megahertz of, of clock speed. And so computers in those days, even the chips, you really had to coax and mess around with them to get them to run at a megahertz. So, 
This was in 1961, a guy named Steve Russell it put together Space War. And I've always said, people like to call me the father of the video game. I, I, I commercialized it. But this is the guy who actually, I think, did almost the first one. Actually, the first one that we know of was this guy called Willie Higginbotham, did a display at the Brookhaven's labs using an oscilloscope. But it was analog, so we're not sure whether we should count that or not. That's the first known game on any kind of a CRT. 1958, a long time before you guys were born. In fact, to date me, 1958, I was just entering high school. There was a thing called computer quiz. This was just a slideshow. It had nothing to do with the computer. And then computer space. This was my first product. And what I was trying to do was figure out a way to make a coin-operated game that would play Space Wars. And came up with the synchronous, pat uh, synchronous technology. This was not a computer either. This is what we call a state machine. It was nothing more than a very, very complex signal generator. Because a von Neumann architecture wasn't possible at that time because you couldn't get it to go fast enough. And we, I put together a little clay model, it was about this tall, for the design, took it to a fiberglass boat manufacturer, and he created, he blew it up and got that cabinet. The coin-operated game business didn't know what to think of it. It was a big change. And then we made a brochure. Uh, the model was a topless dancer at a bar down the street. Uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, and then we started Atari. This was, uh, this was the picture. I'm the guy with the polka dot shirt. Two major innovations there. Pong was one of them. Polka dot shirt was the other. Polka dot shirt did not catch on. But uh, being here in London, you got to understand that when we started exporting Pong, we had a problem here. We appointed a distributor, and he says, love the game, got to change the name. I said, what is it? He says, well, well Pong means bad smell. And he says, would you want to go into a pub or a bar in the United States and have a machine there that says Bart? So in the UK, the coin-operated game was called Ping, really in vain. But, uh, so, but the rest of the world knew it as Pong. These are some of the other Atari games. Space Race, this all used, this was all before the microprocessor. And then of course we all know the Atari. 1977, that continued through till 1983. Um, this operated on a 6502 microprocessor, um, which really was a pretty good processor for its day. Um, understand that the first microprocessor wasn't designed until 1974, and it was only four bits. So it took until 1977 for the microprocessor to actually be good enough to do a video game. And when we have enthusiasm, creativity, and optimism, and the 6502, you get Steve and Steve. Now, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak worked for me. And they did a game called Breakout. I don't know if you remember that. And subsequent to that, they asked me if I would become a third partner 
in Apple Computer for $50,000. So I had the opportunity of owning a third of Apple Computer for $50,000. And I said no. <laughs> 2020 hindsight says that was a mistake. But, you know, it's kind of fun to look back on it. You know, you understand, I knew Jobs too well, and I could not figure out how that guy could actually be the head of a company. <laughs> but what do I know? Anyway. Steve and I hung out in Paris for a couple of times, and, and we became very, very good friends. Um, and we actually learned a lot from each other. And it was really kind of a fun thing to, uh, to hang out with, with guys that were really passionate. Steve had one, one speed, it was totally on all the time. And I'd come into work sometimes at Atari, and he'd, he had a futon under his desk, and he'd pull all-nighters all the time. So if you really want to succeed, you know, work, work really, really hard. Do you know who else used to pull all-nighters all the time? Bill Gates. It's really, you know, in the early days, I knew these guys really well. And they all worked harder than I did. But, you know, win some, lose some. Um, Versix is, is a branch of video games right now that I, I think everybody should look at. The arcade is dead, sort of, but there's still a place for public entertainment. And these things are starting to pop up, and it's a trend. So imagine that you have several rooms. Each has a game that's partially physical, partially metal, and there's a story associated with it. And you pay eight bucks, eight pounds, to go through the experience and play the game. It's popping up all over the place. Take a look at it. It's, it's, it's a area of games that I think is going to blossom and get very, very big in the next few years physically go through a laser maze, choose problems, stamp on spiders. You know, it's, the tools are all there. Now we just add some creativity and you have a business. The next big thing that I think is very important is heads up displays. These are some things that the military is doing. These are actually heads up displays on the glasses. Then, of course, you have the Google Glasses, where you're looking up here all the time. There's going to be so many funny things going on when everybody's wearing Google Glasses. You know, it used to be that people were constantly looking at things other than people's eyes. Now they're going to be looking up there, and it's going to look like a little craziness. But they're going to be great game-playing glasses. You may not realize this. But right here, right today, there is an invisible world inhabited by evil monkeys. The only way you'll be able to see them is through a pair of Google glasses. If you don't get them, they'll continue to do mischief. For example, have you ever put your headphones, you know, earbuds, in your pocket and then pulled them out again? It was the evil monkeys that made them into knots. That couldn't happen all by itself. And so what you really want to be able to do is ge geographically take over the Starbucks, rid it of evil monkeys, and if you do, you get a free latte.
These are all things that will happen once we have an always-on, interesting environment. Incidentally, when you wear the glasses, you get to be as cute as she is. That's an This is another nice thing. Uh, so, some of us who some of us who don't really remember names that well, this is going to be a real boon. We'll be able to figure this out, and, and you, you'll. You'll, you'll have all kinds of interesting life experiences once you have always on, always ready, always technical availability. I don't know how much you guys have been watching, but I think the Oculus Rift is going to be an important process. It's got John Carmack working with it. I don't know if you know who John is, but John was the brain between making Doom a power. He did things with a PC that nobody thought was possible. He writes the tightest, most powerful code. Virtual reality has always had a problem with motion sickness. You know, you, it's really hard to make a business making people sick. And motion sickness in virtual reality is a real thing. However, a lot of people believe that most of the sickness, the motion sickness, comes from latency. And the RIF has several things that are unique, and they believe that they're going to be able to drop latency to perhaps less than two milliseconds. That's really good. And I think it may be undetectable. And so you're no sickness, or at least less sickness. So the thing that's going to be interesting about the Oculus is that it represents a whole new way of creating worlds that are compelling, you know, immersive, and it's as close to a holodeck as you can get. Of course, you pr probably need to be on some kind of a treadmill, and there's all kinds of other things. Haptic control is another area. When you get hit by a fireball, do you really want to be able to feel it? Some people say yes. I've got to tell you a story. We did a, uh, we did a game, a coin-operated game, that was tank. And it was two tanks, you'd go drive around, and unlike real life, you would play a game where you'd say, okay, all you have to do, I'll take a hit here and I'll get two hits on the other person. Well, you, that, that's not real life. If you get hit the first time, you're pretty much toast. So we thought, let's put electrodes in the controls and when you get hit, we'll just shock the hell out of you. <laughs> and, uh, and then somebody said, well, you know, maybe, maybe people won't want to do that. Well, yeah, maybe few people won't, but... So we put a knob so you could dial in the pain. It was really interesting. It was like we could have put a switch because it was either full blast or turned off. But the interesting thing, the game earned much less money than just a normal game. And we figured out it was because people didn't want to be hurt, and yet they didn't want to appear a win. And so rather than just playing it with the thing turned down, they decided just to not play at all. So, Haptic control is going to be very interesting to see when it comes, but, you know, maybe just a little thump when you're getting whacked by a sword or what have you. <coughs> the next area that I would think you should watch are micro-mesh networks. 
setting up a game in a casual space, like on the, with other people in the same area on the tube, think about the minute the doors close, if you can play a competitive game with everybody else that's sitting there. The micro mesh networks have to be able to be, you know, put in, very quickly establish the protocol, and be off so that the next time that the door opens, there is a winner, and you high five. And I believe that in colleges, universities, commutes, even, you know, fun times on a Friday or Saturday night with friends, setting up systems which allow gaming to happen. Somebody's going to make a lot of money on that. And so give it a shot. Games for health. It turns out that games, more than any other activity, build your brain. And it turns out that you can keep from getting old by constantly exercising your brain. Now, here's the trick, though. Stay uncomfortable. The minute you feel comfortable in any game, the neurogenesis is over. For example, I like to play chess. I like to play Go. If you haven't played Go, learn it. It's the most infuriating game in the world, and it's so wonderful. But anyway, all the neurogenesis happens in the early days. For example, the neurogenesis for playing chess, for me, was over when I was 12. That was when I really got to be relatively good. So even though I've been playing the rest of my life, no more neurogenesis. Same thing. People say, oh, I'm keeping active. I do the New York Times crossword puzzle every week. Uh-uh. You, you ran out of the neurogenesis on that. You've got to keep changing. Change the game. Sudoku. That was OK for about the first 20 times you played it. Maybe the first 100. But 101, no neurogenesis at all. Change, 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 and your brain will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Fall into habits, and your brain gets littler and littler and littler. The other thing about it is exercise. If you exercise and get your heart rate up to about 60% or 80% of your max, and you can find your max by taking your age, subtract it from 120 or 220, and that's your heart rate. When you do 20 minutes of exercise at that level, your brain secretes BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. And with that, these are, these are precursor proteins to dendrite and axon growth. Everything that you learn, everything that you do, even your gameplay, will increase when your brain is, is saturated with this chemical, with this protein. You right now, within two years, can increase your IQ five to 10 points. Some of you guys really need it. Let me tell you a little bit about Brain Rush. Brain Rush is my current company, and it's all about learning faster. We have software right now that is teaching subjects 10 times faster than a classroom. And uh, we think once we're finished, we'll be able to do four years of high school in about six months. That's going to leave an awful lot of extra time for you guys to play games <laughs> or learn creative stuff or learn entrepreneurship or learn how to cook, or learn how to do all kinds of things. Because you can get the academics out of the way. During the early days, I call it Education 
Education tended to be one-on-one, -on -one, tiny classes, Socratic discussions, you know. Those kids really look engaged there. They're really having a good time. But this was kind of what school was like in the early days. This doesn't look a lot better. Um, but you could go to school with your, without shoes. Then we had Education 2.0. 2.0 was really the factory school. Big classes, lecture, boring. You may not realize it, but most of those kids are bored out of their minds. Because there's one speed. And half the class was lost. They didn't know what the hell was going on. The other half were bored. Because they'd figured it out a long time ago, and now they were thinking about the birds outside and various other things. Now we have Education 3.0. It's software driven, individual, and adaptive. What does that mean? We are in the middle of the perfect storm. You guys were probably the last generation that is going to struggle and be bored in school. What's happening very quickly all over the world is there is a sea change in the way schools are being operated. This was sort of happening in some schools, the computer lab, but this is really the way it's happening. Tablets, tablets, tablets everywhere. And I bring this up because it's a perfect storm. Cheap hardware, you can actually buy a tablet for 35 bucks right now. Robust networks, used to be if you had 30 people on a network, you t took a full-time administrator to keep the network up. The brain science is becoming very, very clear. Adaptive, active is very important. And some software. And this is where you guys need to get engaged. Education throughout the world chews up between 5 and 7% of GDP of every country in the world. It's a multi-trillion dollar marketplace. And it is going to be sucking up so much software in the next 10 years that if all of you were to focus and do educational software, you should be able to all make a million dollars, which is better than not making a million dollars, and, and, the, and, and make the world a better place. But you have to have it engaged in, in the proper brain science. This is, a, this is an actual learning curve, or attention curve, that has been repeated over and over and over again, so your game your, your learning software has to be very, very short. Can't be more than about 10 minutes. And you say, well, gee, I can play certain games very, very long. In fact, I, I blinked and all of a sudden it's 3 in the morning. But education is a little different, and you have to be able to fit into the classroom in some different ways. So build your brain. And the red part is the thalamus. Now, why, why are video games so good at teaching? It's because they require you to respond. If you were in an fMRI, and if you're watching a lecture, watching a movie, listening or reading a book, almost nothing lights up. The minute you're asked to respond, to make a decision, everything lights up. And that's the key to what video games are all about. That's where they become addictive. 
Our schools are also training out creativity. And many people believe that the next big wave of competition worldwide is not going to be who can produce the most PhDs or the most engineers, but who can provide the most creative outlets. I mean, Apple Computer had the largest market cap. I think they've dropped down a little bit now. But their secret sauce was they outcreated the rest of the world. Bigger market cap than Microsoft, bigger market cap than General Motors, bigger market cap than 99% of all the other companies based on creative projects, creative ways of doing things, design, capability. So remember that when you create an idea that is revolutionary, nobody will tell you you're right. The more that people disagree with you, you're either extremely crazy or you might be right. And the one thing I used to tell Steve is new ideas don't have a constituency. People don't steal revolutionary ideas. They just don't do it. In fact, you can't convince the world to do it. That's why people say, gee, I think I'm just going to be an inventor and I'm going to license things to other companies. Really bad idea. Selling good ideas is almost impossible. Can you imagine, I, I did a thing called Chuck E. Cheese. And Chuck E. Cheese is a big pizza parlor with a game center and a talking mechanical rat. For some reason, I couldn't get anybody to invest in that. Though I thought it was really a good idea. And I ended up growing, it's a billion dollar company right now. Um, I sold it too soon, but anyway, that's another story. When you create, and when you have projects, innovate and get feedback and test and iterate. A lot of people think that the, the idea is the important thing. It's not. Ideas are crap. It's the execution. I like to say the person who, any person who has had a shower has had a good idea. But it's what you do when you get out of the shower that, that matters. And you don't own that idea until you've worked on it, you start putting some work behind it, and slowly you can start to own it. I, I, I get such a kick out of people who say, oh, he stole my idea. I had that idea four years ago. And I say, you lazy shit. Why didn't you do something about it? It wasn't, you know, having an idea and not doing anything about it, you're a jerk. Having an idea is not worth anything unless you work on it. So get it out of your head somehow. Your little innovative brain is going to do wonderful things just by having the idea. And God forbid, don't tell anybody about it. You know, I have people, entrepreneurs coming to me all the time. And they say, I've got this idea, but I can't tell you unless you sign an NDA. I say, I don't, say, I don't, I don't sign NDAs. I say, ideas are shit. What, what have you done? Well, I just had the idea. Oh, it's, it's how I learned to not listen to ideas from the outside. A guy was introduced by my attorney, you know, pretty good guy. Um, and we spent a day going through a non-disclosure thing like that. And then we got the paperwork all done. And he came in and he said, 
baseball. I said, yeah. He says, you need to make a baseball game. I say, yeah. What, what, what's your idea? Well, baseball. You should do a baseball game. I looked at him and I said, you've got to be kidding me. You think that we've been in the game business for four years, that we have not, that, and that we've done lists of every sports game that has ever been, including some things that are only played in Tanzania and, and, and Mongolia, and, and that somehow you've wasted all this time. I would have thrown the guy out the window, except I was on the, the ground floor and I didn't think it would hurt him that much. But it, it's one of those things where this idea, that ideas become important, just really make me un unhappy. This is a commercial. I've written a book. It's called Finding the Next Steve Jobs. It's about creativity, how you build your creative brain, how you do things. It will be, uh, I think it's available here in the UK at the end of this month. So um, I want you to all go out and buy several copies. Um, I understand that they're actually good to eat for breakfast, so you need several. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's, it's been fun. Do you know how I ended up writing that book? I have been doing this, uh, this thing on brain science and it tells you to do something different. And so one of the mechanisms is to throw the dice every year, and it tells you that you have to do something that you've sort of had on your list, but you've never done it. 19, or, uh, 2011, January 1, I threw the dice, and it came up, write a book. Now, you've got to understand, I'm an engineer. I can't spell, I'm dyslexic, so my grammar is horrible, particularly when I write it down, but I'm a fast typist. And I said, okay. And the neat thing about when the dice tells you to do it, you don't have to overthink it. Like, I never imagined that I could ever write a book and get it published. I mean, I really didn't. I almost flunked freshman English when I was in college, but I'm pretty good at math. And, uh, but I thought, okay, I'm just going to write it. And I discovered all kinds of crazy things, like editors who can actually punctuate and spell. And so you get them to do things. And then you get an editor who can rearrange things so the, there's a better flow. And all of a sudden, you, get a, you kind of get a reader, readable book. And so I did this one, but it, this was actually my second book. My first one is called Video Games 2071. And I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna put that out in a little while. But it's basically me inventing games 100 years without any worry about technology. The nice thing about science fiction is the stuff doesn't have to work today. It's just postulated. And so if you really want to, uh, when I publish that, I want you guys all to buy that one too, but it's going to be more fun. It's, it's a novel. Keep higher, build your brain, act. With Steve Jobs, any entrepreneur, was it their creativity or was it they constantly were acting? You would be surprised how much better your life will be if you just try stuff. Make it happen. You can learn Unity in a few weeks. You can write an app after that. If you are a good game player, you have all the mental smarts that are necessary to be a good game designer. 
teach yourself the Unity engine. There's self, you know, there's all kinds of self tutorials. And if you act and work on this two hours a day for the next three months, you'll be able to have an app on the app score at the end of that time. And if it turns out to be Angry Birds, you're in really good shape. So have fun with life. Look for your own intensity. Live an intense life. Build your brain. Move physical activity. Always kind of look out of your brain as a 14-year-old. It's how you keep your enthusiasm and your, your lifestyle. And go into Brain Rush, use some of the tools, build stuff, and learn, and uh, you'll have a happier life. Thank you very much. Now it's your turn to speak. Hi, um, my name is Jonathan Prude. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, a, uh, I'm from the States, so I grew up with Chuck E. Cheese, so thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Your uh, parents and, hate me, you know. <laughs> well, my belly with the pizza, maybe. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, why did you, sp and this is kind of out there, but why did you use Blockbuster Entertainment at the bottom of the screen when you were presenting the um, heads-up display with the pedophile and the uh, Gap shirt for sale and all that? You know, I just found that slide on the internet and I just stole it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> You know, isn't this, the campus party, a great thing? I mean, are you guys having as much fun as I am? You know? Game till you drop and then crawl into a tent. What could be better? You know, one of the things, I'll tell you, one thing, one thing might be better. Burning Man. Have you ever heard of that? It's basically a a bunch of crazy people building artworks in the middle of the desert. They build a city of 55,000 and it lasts for a week. It's about five miles across in the middle of the, it's, it's a, in the middle of the desert. It's really great fun. You know, it's almost like Mecca. You should go there once in your life anyway. Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about um, how the reception to the brain rush and using gaming for education has been in traditional uh, educational establishments and do they kind of fear the gameplay element? The, our, we're really just sort of at the beginning. We've defined 12 training engines and we've got things that go probably up through the top three, four levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And we have found a very, very cynical look on the part of certain educators. Understand that any time you're pushing up against a bureaucracy, it's very difficult. But we're starting to get a great deal of buy-in with just, you know, all you need are three or four bellwether districts to climb in. And our economic model is a freemium model. We have free content. Most of the stuff can be used in schools without charge. We make a little bit of money on advertising, but then we have a paywall that 
certain premium content is available. We, we think that uh, by this time next year, we'll have somewhere between three and five million students from all over the world. Okay. And, uh, and teachers, think of it as kind of like Wikipedia. Teachers are building a lot of the brain rushes on top of our engine that gives all the brain smarts that go into it. Go in and play with it. And in fact, make a brain rush yourself. You guys are clever. And, uh, and if, if people start using it, it'll take you guys and girls. I, I say guys, and I mean girls, too, so just so you know. Um, my wife yells at me. She thinks I'm sexist, but I'm not. At least I don't think I am. Anyway. And, and give it a go, and if you get a lot of hits, we'll share the advertising revenue with you. And if you want to put it on the other side of the paywall, maybe you can make a few, a few bucks. Hi. Um, I'm an avid gamer. Absolutely love games on apps and on PCs. Um, but I also really want to get into app development and game development, but I've got no previous history, no knowledge of it. What would be the best advice you can give me to really doing that? Well, I think that... Um, Wherever, whenever you want to get into business, try as hard as you can to find blue ocean. That is, be where no one else is. And long before you write a line of code, write your marketing materials. Look and see, you know, figure out where you're going to be selling your app. It's going to be in the App Store, in uh, Android or Apple, and t start to look at what people see and what how they make decisions in that in that space, and write that copy long before you write a line of code because. In these very very red ocean, very very competitive markets. It's all about discoverability and figuring out how much you're going to charge, whether it's a freemium model, whether there's various other things. It's actually more important than how good the game is. Now, once you're discovered, you need to have a good game. But having a good game without the good marketing material, you're just wasting your time. So, I really recommend, before you ever start a project, write the marketing material every time. Um, like, whenever I do, I have this pile of business plans. And what I do is, when I get the idea in the shower, I get out of the shower, and I write a mini business plan takes me maybe an hour, and I just try to write down everything that I think I know about the business. I try to estimate what it's going to cost to do it, what kind of a market it would be, and, and just try to guess about the size of the market as much as I can figure out. And then I put it in a pile. And what happens once those business plans are marinating, one of them will call out to me. And it's really surprising when one does. And sometimes they call out to me because I meet a person who would be perfect for the team, or the market conditions are exactly right, or I'm at a cocktail party and I'm talking to a venture capitalist, and they say, gee, I'm, I'm looking for these kinds of companies. I pull one out and dust it off and send it to him, you know? And, uh, and getting things right timed is really important. I've lost a massive amount of money by having, by not having the timing right. I did a robotics company one time. I spent a huge amount of my own money on it and lost it all because the technology was just too hard. And so 
you know, when you're starting a business, there's an old story that says, if you want to get a good idea, get lots of ideas. And I really recommend that. Because once you get your one idea, it, it can sometimes force you into incorrect timing. Hello. Um, I'm an electronic engineer, and both of my sons are here, and they're both engineering graduates. This, so uh, I'm very pleased to Could hear you. Could you hold it up a little bit? I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you describe yourself as an engineer, because uh, I'm an engineer, and both of my sons are here at Campus Party, and they're mechanical engineers. But um, I wanted to ask, what are you curious about? Because when I'm uh, talking to students, I try to encourage them to be curious outside the field of electronics and computing and to look to, uh, you know, when you were talking about the immersive gaming, look to architecture, look to art installations and, uh, you know, other fields. So I'm just wanting to know, where are you curious about? Where are new ideas and inspirations coming, other than obviously the brain science? I think I understood your English, though it's, it was... You're British and sometimes, but I think your question was, how do I, uh, how do I, how, how do we instill enthusiasm and curiosity in, in the students that we have? That's really hard. Um, every kid in kindergarten is curious and enthusiastic. Like when I go into a kindergarten class or even the first grade, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and excitement, and it's only after the kids get it beaten out of them <laughs> in some ways that I think they lose that. I believe that by making things adaptive, we can keep everybody engaged. The lecture model does not work. It's broken, has been broken for a long time. And I believe that we will be able to maintain enthusiasm and creativity if we get rid of the lecture model and get into project-based learning and adaptive software. Our, our brain rushes are about 10 minutes. And they are so fast-paced that kids, even though you look at it and you say, what's fun about learning times tables or Spanish vocabulary? But because it's fast-paced and it becomes easy, the gamification of it happens automatically, and the kids think it's fun. Now, it's not, it's not going to compete in the arena of totally entertainment games. But once you say this is school, it's so much better, and they have a lot of fun at it. We've, we've had situations where kids have literally, in the space of three weeks, gone through every brain rush we've had. You know, and when you look at it, you say, geez, didn't they sleep? But they just got into the groove and decided they wanted to learn all this stuff. And so I guess the real answer is I don't know. I do know we're on the right path, and I think that in the next five years, we're going to know more about learning than ever before, than, than, than what we've learned about learning up till now. And for example, we know within a few seconds of how long it took you to master a concept. So. What kind of breakfast should you eat? Brain, the brain use, uses and burns a tremendous amount of, of glucose. You know, it, 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 it burns at least a third of all your calories. Your brain is just an energy hog. And so, does it say that you should eat a high carb breakfast? Should you carbo pack? Yet, if you eat too many carbs, you get sleepy sometimes, too. So maybe protein, where you can release the glucose and, and do other things coming along. 
The fact is, we don't know. But I think that our software is going to give us the tools that we can start match racing it so that a good, so that we can see that if certain kids, certain adults, eat a high carb breakfast, they'll outperform somebody who does a, a high protein or not. If we can't put a number on something, we don't know what it is. And when you talk to people about nutrition, you get a whole bunch of attitude and opinion, but you don't have data. And uh, just that as an example, we may be able to supercharge. We do know that if you exercise a student before school, all the effects of ADHD go away without drugs. Because Paleo Man basically ran, walked 20 to 30 miles a day. Paleo Woman walked three to five. And so it's no wonder our genetics, when we were built, we evolved during this time. And so any, so, you know, basically sitting still in a classroom is anti-genetics. And so all the boys that are popping around, they're self-medicating through fidgeting, things like that. I mean, I, I think it's criminal that we're doping up kids with all kinds of, of anti-anxiety. Just run the shit out of them, anyway. Oh. Unfortunately, we've run out of time now, so, um, okay. Can we have one last question then, please? Hi there. I'll talk to you later. Thank you for uh, attending. I've been looking forward to seeing you at some point. I have two questions, but I understand because we're out of time that I'll stick to one. I recently took the controversial decision of not going to uni, and um, my parents and my peers both disagree with this decision. And I was wondering what your opinion was on attending university, uh, especially for people who decide to choose an entrepreneurial career path. Thank you. I have, I have eight children. I have five sons. And uh, right now, my oldest son went to university, got a degree in, in electrical engineering, computer science. He has his own business. He's 34. They'll do about $10 million in sales this year. And uh, he and his partner, he, he owns about half of it, doing pretty well. My 19-year-old came home from high school one day, said, Dad, I'm dropping out. I said, come on, you're not dropping out. He says, Dad, I don't do busy work. I said, well, it might not be busy work. And he says, no, I guarantee you it's busy work, and I don't do it. And he says, I get, I get A's on the test, but my idiot teachers are giving me C's because I don't turn in homework. He says, they're stupid. My household doesn't lack for arrogance. They, they have it in really big, big space. So anyway, we were able to convince him to stay into high school and finish. But the minute he graduated from high school, he said, I'm starting my business. And he has. He's now 19 years old. One year later, he has, his business is actually Versix. And this year he'll do somewhere between a half a million and a million dollars in sales. He's living well. And he's convinced that he is going to make a billion dollars before he's 25. Now, he is an arrogant little shit. I know that. <laughs> but, um, but he might pull it off. I have another son who has a, uh, uh, 
was part of a sort of a Google type marketing program that I think Google will buy someday. I have a daughter who is a certified financial planner. She says, if all the boys make as much money as they think they will, I'll, I'll figure out a way that they can invest it and keep it. Then I have a guy who's a screenwriter, one of my sons, and he's, he borrows money from me. <laughs> well, you know, in Los Angeles, do you know how you get a screenwriter off your doorstep? You pay for the pizza. <laughs> uh, and I have another son who is a web developer, is doing quite well. In fact, if you want to see his work, go into nolanbushnell.com and my website, it's all done by my son, for which I paid him way too much money. But that's another story. Um, I believe that college today can be a huge waste of time. I think it can be a gateway because I think that there are certain ways, like if you want to write really good structured code, I think you need to have some formal training. If you lack self-discipline, you probably need to continue some education. If you're self-disciplined, I mean, Jobs, Gates, both of them dropped out of college. They've done relatively well. Um, I, for one, uh, I graduated from college, but I had the distinction of being the lowest grade point in my graduating class. I was 247 in a class of 247. Now, you can look at that two ways. You can either say, gee, Nolan, why didn't you do better? And I said, hey, I got the degree. I didn't do one bit of work more than I needed to. I, did a really, I got a really efficient degree. But I, didn't, but I didn't do homework either. I had too much girl chasing and beer to drink. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to do some photographs and autographs uh, around 3 o'clock over here. Was it 3 o'clock? 3.30. Something like that. So thanks for your time. It's been great being with you.